when I was 15. I wanted to make some extra money, so I started babysitting. One evening, I got a call from a married couple asking me if I could babysit for their children. They had a five-year-old girl named Katie. I agreed and turned up at their house at the appointed time. As the parents were getting ready to leave, they told me that their daughter had some imaginary friends and sometimes, at night, she would talk to them. <laughs> Don't let it freak you out. <laughs> the father chuckled. After they were gone, I made dinner for Katie and we played some board games. Then, I gave her a bath and got her ready for bed. I tucked the little girl in, kissed her goodnight and went downstairs to do some homework. About an hour later, I heard Katie's voice. I thought she might be calling me, so I went up to her room to check on her. When I opened her bedroom door, she was sitting upright in bed, talking to the closet. I walked in hesitantly, looking at Katie. I heard her mumbling things, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. Katie? Who are you talking to? I asked. The man with the red face. She said. A chill ran down my spine. Um, is he in your closet? I asked. Yes, said the little girl. He makes funny faces at me sometimes. What, what does he look like? I asked, my voice trembling. She made a face like someone choking and gasping for air. I slammed the door shut. Then, Katie looked up and started to flip out, screaming her head off. Go away! She cried. Get out! She was looking straight at me. Katie, stop shouting. I said, trying to calm her down. Who are you talking to? Who are you telling to go away? The woman. She replied. What woman? I asked. The woman who always comes. Katie moaned. She doesn't like the man with the red face. Does she have a red face too? I asked. No. The little girl replied and her eyes grew wide. She doesn't have a face. Where is this woman? I asked. Then, she said the words that will haunt my dreams forever. She's crawling on the ceiling like a spider. With that, Katie lay down and after a few moments, she was fast asleep. I was shaking with fear. That night, when Kate's parents came home, I was still trembling. They asked if everything was okay. I lied and told them everything was fine. The husband told me he would drive me home. When I got home that night, it was very late and I was exhausted, but I was glad to get away from that house. The next day, I decided to look into the history of the house and quickly found something that shocked me. Apparently, the house had once belonged to a family of four. The father found out that his wife was cheating on him and when he confronted her about it, she told him she wanted a divorce. The man flew into a rage and went on a murderous rampage, removing and cutting the flesh from his wife's body 
while she was still alive and beating his two children to death. When he came to his senses and realized what he had done, he hung himself in the upstairs closet. The closet. The red face. Red with blood. Gasping for air. The woman with no face. It was all too familiar. I refused to babysit for them again. A few months later, the family moved away and the house is abandoned now. On the morning of her birthday, Lucy's mother woke her up and told her a package had arrived in the mail and it was addressed to her. The girl hurriedly unwrapped the gift and was horrified at what she found inside. It was the most disgusting old doll she had ever seen. It was completely bald and its skin was cracked and caked in dirt. The worst thing of all was its teeth. They were long, pointy, sharp, and beastly. They looked like an animal's fangs. With a shiver, she took the doll and threw it into a corner. Her mother scolded her, telling her that someone had gone to a lot of trouble to send her this antique doll. Her mother told her that she had better appreciate it. Lucy tried to protest, but her mother would not listen. She forced the young girl to keep the doll. So to put her mind at rest, Lucy stuffed the antique doll into the little cupboard under the stairs, behind a pile of shoes where she wouldn't have to look at the ugly, evil little thing. It was not until a few nights later when Lucy was lying in bed that she heard a noise. A shuffling sound, which went on for about five minutes, then a brief dragging noise, and finally, a scuttling, like light little footsteps walking very fast. By now... Lucy was shaking in her bed with fear, unable to move. Then she thought she heard a faint, raspy voice whispering quietly from downstairs. Lucy always slept with the door open and the landing light on, as she was a little scared of the dark. She heard the voice say, Lucy, I'm on the first step. Then loud scrambling again, as whatever was speaking apparently turned tail and returned to its place of hiding. Lucy was so scared that she didn't sleep a wink that night, but laid in fear until the break of dawn, when her mother got her up for school. Lucy tried to explain to her mother what had happened that night, but was so tired that her mother passed it off as just a dream. She began to believe it might be the case. Of course, it wasn't. Lucy begged her parents to let her throw the antique doll in the garbage, but they insisted that it was a present. She had to keep it. So Lucy reluctantly went back to bed, telling herself that it had only been a dream. She checked the cupboard under the stairs, but the doll was exactly where Lucy had left her. That night, Lucy fought sleep, but she eventually drifted off. Presently, the deep, disembodied voice woke Lucy again. She wondered if she could only hear it in her head. Lucy... I'm on the fourth step, it said. Then came to scuffling noise, and the voice didn't reoccur that night. Lucy was crying by now. She didn't sleep. At school, Lucy told her friends about the doll, and of course they laughed at her. Lucy could only think that if the doll was climbing four steps at a time, there would only be one more night to go. That night, Lucy decided to shut her bedroom door. When her mother turned her light out, she asked why Lucy was no longer scared of the dark. Lucy replied that she was, and could she leave her light on instead of the hall light? But her mother pointed out that her bedroom light was so bright it would keep her awake, and said no. Therefore, Lucy agreed to sleep without a light. She opened the bedroom curtains instead to light the room a little anyway, and just as she began to doze, she heard the noise. And then came the voice again, very clear this time. Lucy, I'm on the top step. In the darkness of her bedroom, Lucy heard a click and trembled with fear. She wasn't sure, but she thought she could see her bedroom door opening very, very slowly. The next morning, Lucy's parents found her body at the bottom of the stairs. 
They guessed that she must have been on her way to the toilet during the night. In the darkness, she slipped and had fallen down the stairs, breaking her neck. The antique doll was found beside her body and was buried with Lucy. Everyone said what a tragedy it was. She loved that doll, said her mother. And now, they can be together. Forever. When I was 12 years old, we lived in a really old house. It was at least 200 years old and there were rumors that it was haunted. One night, as I was lying in bed, my mother came into my room. At least, I thought it was my mother. The room was dark and the only light was coming from the hallway. Instead of saying goodnight, she started to tell me a weird and disturbing story about how a demon once came to a 12 year old girl. She said the demon came at night, crawled up next to the girl and began growling in her left ear. She told me the girl said the Lord's Prayer over and over, and the demon eventually went away. I remember just lying there, looking at her and wondering why she was telling me this story, especially right before I went to sleep. She was really freaking me out. Eventually, she finished the story and just got up and left without saying any more. I lay there in the darkness trying to figure out why my mom would say those things. I tried to put it out of my mind and concentrate on getting back to sleep. All of a sudden, I heard the most awful noise I have ever heard in my life. It was in my left ear. I couldn't tell if the sound was human or animal. It was a guttural, grating, growling, screeching, moaning sound that left me terrified. I was too scared to move, too scared to breathe. I was paralyzed by fear. I wanted to scream, but I was afraid of what might happen if I did. At that moment, I thought of the Lord's Prayer and started reciting it in my head. I was too terrified to say anything aloud. The growling continued for what felt like eternity. Then suddenly, it stopped. I laid there listening for any of the sounds, but all I could hear was an eerie silence. I lay awake all night until the sun came up. The next morning, I asked my mother about the story she had told me. She claimed she knew nothing about it. She said she had never come into my room that previous night. What she said scared me even more than the growling itself. That wasn't me. Why would I tell you such a horrible story? Why would I scare you like that at bedtime? To this day, I still cannot come up with an explanation. I believe that whoever or whatever it was that came into my room that night, it was not my mother. I think it was her doppelganger or a protective spirit disguised as her, trying to warn me of what was about to happen, trying to tell me how to save myself from the demon that was about to come for me. When I was 7 years old, I started having intense nightmares. I would wake up every night drenched in sweat with my heart beating fast and a dying scream in my throat. Most of the time, I could never remember the dreams or what had scared me so much. I only remembered one nightmare, but it seemed to be reoccurring over and over. In the dream, I found myself standing in a deep pit at the bottom of a muddy hill. My family were perched at the top of the hill looking down at me. Their eyes were black and hollow looking. When I looked down, I could see the mud beneath my feet boiling and bubbling. Then, 
Something began crawling out of the mud. I tried to scream, but nothing would come out. I tried to climb up the hill, but I kept losing my grip and slipping and sliding back down into the pit. Eventually, I felt my body go very stiff and I was unable to move. My breathing stopped. I felt like I had died. That's when I woke up. I couldn't move my arms or legs. It felt like someone was holding me down. It was dark and I couldn't hear anything. Just a deep, foreboding silence. Then, I heard the breathing. It wasn't my breathing. It was a deep, wheezing, guttural sound. There was no other noise in the world, except for this bestial wheezing. As I lay there in my bed, my body frozen and unable to move, I saw something lurking in the darkness that horrified me. I can only describe it as a demon. It was crouched in the corner of my room with wide eyes that glowed red as they stared at me. It was grinning at me with a mouth full of razor sharp teeth. It knew I was awake. That grotesque face will burn into my head until the day I die. I closed my eyes and began screaming. I couldn't move a muscle. All I could do was scream. All of a sudden, my mother burst into my room, and when she flicked the switch to turn the lights on, the light bulb exploded. When I opened my eyes, there was nothing there. The demon was gone. My mom asked me what was wrong, and I told her what I had seen. I spent a few months sleeping in her room until I felt safe enough to go back into my room. Even today, whenever I think about this incident, I still get the chills, and I have to take a minute to compose myself. The Seventh Barn A wealthy farmer who owned a lot of land built a new barn on his property every time his wife had a baby. He named each barn after each of his kids, and by the time this story takes place they had six kids and were expecting number seven. But the farmer's wife died in childbirth, and so did the unborn baby. The farmer went insane with grief and couldn't tend to his farm. The family had no money and the farm started going under. They say the farmer, in his madness and despair, took an axe one night and led his children out to the barns, one by one, and murdered them. He buried their bodies in the seventh barn. It was in the seventh barn that the farmer hung himself. Eventually, as the story goes, all the barns were torn down and the land was sold off. All except for number seven. Nobody would buy the land because of what had happened there. It was abandoned and soon fell into disrepair. They say if you go to that barn at night you can see the ghost of the farmer hanging from the rafters and swinging in the wind, dwelling on his terrible crime for all eternity. No one was ever really sure where the seventh barn was located. It was definitely in Ohio, and some say it was the Crans Farm in Cuyahoga Valley, or at Top of the World in Northampton. In 1997, a local Ohio teacher claimed that he had found the infamous barn's real location. He said that none of the barns had ever been torn down. They had simply been incorporated into neighboring farms. According to the teacher, he pinpointed the location because barns on neighboring properties all had nameplates on their doors with the names of children engraved on them. The teacher and his son set out one night to visit the barn, hoping to capture some paranormal activity on video. The next morning, the teacher's wife reported her husband and son missing. Police found their abandoned car by the roadside. While searching the area, they entered a barn in a nearby field and found the dead bodies of the teacher and his son hanging from the rafters. A newly married couple, Bill and Mabel, bought a house in a nice secluded part of Maine. 
after they moved in. Their neighbors came to visit and warned them that their house was haunted. Bill and Mabel disregarded the tall tales they heard from their neighbors. They didn't believe in ghosts and weren't about to start now just because some silly neighbors believed in the paranormal. But Mabel was curious about the history of the house. So she contacted the real estate agent and told them she had heard odd stories about the house being haunted. The realtor said that, by law, he should have disclosed the history of the house. Apparently, there had been a string of horrible murders committed in the house years before by an insane serial killer. The murders were only discovered after the killer had died. He had been smoking in bed when he fell asleep and accidentally dropped a cigarette on his bed sheets. His bed caught fire and he burned alive without ever waking up. His corpse had lain undiscovered in the house for years. Eventually, the police had broken in and found his decomposing body lying in bed. They dug up the garden and found the remains of his victims. The story unnerved Mabel and she began having nightmares about the killer. She told her husband that she was beginning to believe that the stories of the haunting could be true. Mabel frequently complained about the feeling that someone was in the room during the night and sometimes she would wake suddenly during the night, convinced that she had felt cold bony hands touching her. Bill thought Mabel was just being silly, but to keep his wife happy, he promised to stay up all night and keep watch over her. Bill was confident that if she woke up after feeling the cold bony hands and nobody was there, she would realize that it was all in her imagination. True to his word, Billy stayed up the whole night. Around midnight, the room began to feel uncomfortably warm and he was gripped by the feeling of an overwhelming thirst. Leaving Mabel sleeping softly, he went downstairs to the kitchen to get a glass of water. Upstairs, in the darkened bedroom, Mabel awoke with a start. She heard footsteps outside the door and then someone came into the room. She assumed it was her husband, Bill. She leaned over in bed to give him a kiss but her lips touched something cold and bony. Bill heard the most horrible screaming coming from Mabel's room. He rushed upstairs and screamed in horror at what he found. Mabel's dead body lay stretched out on the bed. Her face was twisted in an expression of utter terror. Bill rushed downstairs and called the police. Several nights later, Bill was finally sleeping peacefully. Until around midnight, again feeling very thirsty. He went downstairs and got a glass of water. When he went back upstairs, he was surprised to see a large lump in the bed. It was moving. He ran over and ripped off the bed sheets. The ghost of Mabel sat up in the bed. She had tears in her eyes and her cheeks were hollow and sunken. The dark form of another man crouched beside her. A terrible skeletal man with the face of a desiccated corpse. The skeleton man clutched Mabel's head in his cold bony grasp and forced her to kiss him. Tears streamed down Mabel's face. In her hand, she held the biggest knife Bill had ever seen. Didn't you promise, Billy? Didn't you promise? Till death do us part, you promised. Screamed Mabel as she floated towards the frightened and paralyzed Bill. I am a 20 year old female and this took place back in March. I was 19 years old at the time. It was the end of spring break and I was returning to Texas from California. I had just spent my vacation with my sister who lives in San Francisco. Every college kid counts down the days until spring break 
and my vacation had gone rather well. However, I was slightly okay with returning to the essays and research papers, because I missed my friends, my bed, and my cat. Maybe not in that particular order. I was flying alone, something I don't like doing for multiple reasons, and had only one layover in Dallas. I don't like traveling alone because I've had some bad experiences, and I happen to look a lot younger than 20. Most often people say I look 13 or 14 at most, and I've always hated that about myself. But I'm told I'll be grateful when I'm older. As of now, it's just immensely frustrating. The last time I was on a plane by myself, the attendant thought I was an unaccompanied minor named Taylor. I quickly assured her I was not the minor in question. The time before that, I was asked to move away from the emergency exit because I had to be at least 16 to sit there, which obviously I was. Anyway, my boyfriend was picking me up from the airport and I was excited. I wore the pink members only jacket he had bought for me and tried to look my best, which is difficult when traveling. When the plane arrived in Dallas, we had some really terrible weather and the turbulence was scary. But no matter, soon I would be on another flight to Houston. I took the train around to the sea terminal and made my way to my gate, only to find out that due to torrential rain and lightning, my flight had been cancelled. I was crushed, but determined. So I took my ticket to be exchanged for a later flight. It seemed many others had the same grievance and were open to do the same. As I was standing in line, a friendly looking older man came up to stand behind me. Are you alone? He asked. Everyone seemed to be conversing with one another, complaining about the weather and pondering their options to get home. It didn't seem like a big deal because strangers always seem to connect in situations like this one. We were all frustrated and I also felt safe in the crowded airport. So I answered him truthfully and continued to wait in line. The man behind the counter said I was in luck, that there were only two seats left on another flight to Houston and that I could make it if I hurried. I rushed to board the train to Terminal A to catch my new flight and upon reaching the gate was faced with the same situation. This new flight was cancelled too. The man from before had followed me to the gate and was in the same boat. I exchanged my ticket for an even later flight and resolutely marched myself to the new gate only to be told the same as before. Literally, two or three more times on top, because I really didn't want to give up and had no other options. The man shadowed me during the entire ordeal, but I didn't really find it strange. We were just two individuals stranded in an airport after all. The last gate I went to, I noticed that he was still following me. He walked over to me and begins to chat about that awful luck that we were having. Someone is eavesdropping nearby and suggests that I rent a car. I politely tell them that I am not old enough and the man smiles and said to me, well, I'm old enough to rent a car. How about this? I'll rent one, you can sleep and I'll drive. I look at him, and the way he is staring at me legitimately scares me. I finally begin to feel that something is off, and I respond, uh, no, but thank you, I'm going pretty far. His smile falters for a moment, 
Then he suggests that he buys me some food. I am starving, and I am tempted. I hesitate for a moment, but then I remember a book I'd read about a girl who was stolen from the airport after a man drugs her coffee. This gives me the strength to deny my grumbling stomach and decline him again. He follows me. I don't know why. He's already told me that he's going to rent a car and leave. He points to a Mexican restaurant and says, Ooh, how about this place? He has this strange look on his face and is standing far too close to me. I shake my head and say, I told you I'm not really hungry, which is a lie, even though I can smell something delicious and I almost give in. But my face does not betray my hunger, and I keep my pace. Okay, okay. What about burgers, then? He looks a bit annoyed. This guy does not give up easily. I ignore him, and this causes him to glare at me angrily, and then just walk away. I breathe a sigh of relief, and I call my sister to tell her about him. Not in a catty sort of way, just a wow, that guy was persistent, kind of thing. I settle into a chair to think about my options. I feel pretty alone and worried. My latest ticket has me leaving around midnight, and it was about 9pm. At that point, I had been in the airport since 5pm. If this last flight didn't work out, I had no clue what I would do. I had no money for a hotel, and didn't fancy sleeping in a chair. The last time I fell asleep in public, which was on a train in France, a lady attempted to steal my backpack. But that is another story. I look up about 30 minutes later, to see the very same man from before walking towards me. I tuck my legs up in my chair nervously and pretended to play on my phone. Hey, still here? He asks. He seemed to have called down. I just stare at him and he clears his throat and tries again. <clears throat> so I was thinking you should come and stay at my aunt's house with me for the night. That's where I'm staying tonight. It would be no problem. You just don't want to be in this airport all night, all alone. I shake my head. No, I'm fine. Then I turn my attention back to my phone. I didn't even make eye contact. I felt really uncomfortable. And he tries to convince me. And I have to say no firmly several more times. He looks angry, really angry. His hands are clenched and his smile is obviously fake. It looks as if he will shatter his teeth if he clenches his jaw any tighter. I wonder to myself why he hasn't left the airport yet. Then I notice his luggage is no longer with him. He was rolling it behind him and now he isn't. Where would he have put it if he hadn't just left it and so much time had passed? Why is he back here? As I'm thinking all of this, he is just standing there, staring at me. After what feels like forever, he storms off again. So I feel anxious because of him. So anxious, in fact, that I grab my things and moved to a different gate to wait. My phone was quickly depleting in its charge and I didn't want to be without it. So I charge it and plug it into the outlet in the floor. I curled up in the aisle between the chairs to wait. My sister called about an hour later and I was talking to her, telling her how creepy the dark weather outside looked. When I see him, again, walking around, glancing here and there, 
obviously in search of me. I hunch down even further. But my pink jacket put me like a beacon. He locked eyes with me and I looked down. My sister said to stay on the phone. So I did. Well, there you are, he said, not even acknowledging that I am in the middle of a phone call. I continue talking to my sister. When it becomes apparent that he isn't leaving and doesn't care that I am on the phone, I finally look up. So you're still here? Look, you need to come with me. You can stay at my grandparents tonight. They would love to have you. They wouldn't mind me bringing you at all. Just come with me. I got chills. I don't know why, but something in his eyes told me that he was lying through those shiny white teeth of his. You said you were staying with your aunt. His face dropped. It went from cool and collected to something else. Not even anger this time and not defeat either. Almost like amusement. Something like the cat that ate the canary. He shrugs his shoulders like I tried. But we both recognized that he was caught in his lie. The entire time my sister was saying, hello, hello, over the phone repeatedly. But I was sort of shocked at how indifferent he was catching me. I go back to my conversation and he says, if you change your mind, and lets the trail of thought off while walking away backwards. Eyes still on me. I call my boyfriend after and tell him about this exchange. And he tells me to find a security guard. I look around for one, but couldn't find one. It was creepy because I've never seen an airport so deserted. I end up just deciding to move again and lay down between two different aisles out of view. A boy my age walks by and asks why I'm laying on the floor. And I respond a little aggressively, because I want to. He laughs and puts his hands up, the unspoken sign for, whoa, take it easy, got a bad ass over here. I apologize for my gruffness and tell him that a man was making me nervous. He jokingly said he'll protect me. And because he seems harmless, and I mention my boyfriend, I converse with him for a while. And he tells me he saw me and wondered why the blonde girl was looking so sad. A little while later, I'm thankful I did not brush off this stranger because I see the man again walking around. We made eye contact, but he did not attempt to approach me because I was no longer alone. Maybe he was just some middle-aged man trying to get a girlfriend or something, but scaring someone isn't the way to do it. Even if he meant me absolutely no harm, he was too aggressive and angry. Of course, all of this is on the more optimistic side, whereas realistically, and through his lies, I am of the persuasion that his intentions were far more dubious. And if my kindness wouldn't have faltered and I would have gone with him, as stupid as that may have been, who knows, I may not even have been around to When I was 14, I was waiting for the bus and this pickup truck pulled up beside me. The driver kept waving at me to come closer and he held up a map. It seemed like he wanted directions. I went over to the truck and he rolled down the window. I didn't realize what was happening until he reached out and tried to grab me by the hair. I dropped my bag and ran for it as he sped off. When I got home, I woke my mom up and I told her what had happened. She flipped out. Then, we looked out the window. Surprise, surprise. The truck was sitting across the street and the man was sitting in the driver's seat, staring up at us. That's when I flipped out. 
My mom called the police and gave them a description, but the man drove off. Later on, the police called back to tell us that they had pulled someone over and they wanted me to come take a look at him. They put me in the back of an unmarked patrol car with tinted windows and drove me past the guy who was being questioned outside his truck. It was him. I almost had a panic attack. They charged him with attempted kidnapping. It made all the local newspapers. The spot where they pulled him over was right in front of an elementary school and when they searched his truck, they found rope, duct tape, and an axe. I'll start by telling you a few things about me. I'm 18 years old and live in northern Canada, in two different homes. One is with my father, who lives right in the middle of 222 acres of woods. We've got but a single neighbor, who is situated about a kilometer away. My second home is with my mother. She lives on the edge of a city, close to the woods, and the main shopping center. The story is split into three parts, and believe me, it may sound crazy, but I swear, all of this is true. The first part of the story starts at my father's house. I'd often go for walks in the woods. It was peaceful and quiet. I'd always bring my three dogs for protection, a German Shepherd and two Australian Shepherds. Nothing ever happened in the woods. There was the occasional sighting of bears and we found quite a few lynx tracks, but nothing out of the ordinary until something started watching me from the woods. A black figure of sorts. At first, I thought it was just my paranoid mind playing tricks on me, so I shrugged it off. A few days passed since I first felt the strange watching presence. It was a cold day out. The sun was gone and the wind came from the north making it even colder. It was around noon and it was time for me to bring the dogs out for a walk. I brought them down to the road that leads to my house. Nobody was around and it was silent all over, except for the wind blowing through the tree leaves. I was calm, but then it felt like I was being followed. Of course my dogs were following me, but this feeling was dark. I continued and eventually turned back to go home. Everyone was gone so I arrived to an empty house. As I was about to bring the dogs into their kennel, I noticed one of the Aussies was frozen in place. He was staring into the woods. I tried to get his attention, but he would not budge. I walked over to him, pat his head. He only growled, but not to me. He growled to whatever was in the woods. The dog was pacing, tail tucked between his legs and ears held back. That made me feel a little uneasy, since I had been feeling watched or followed during the walk. It also meant I wasn't the only one who felt it. I decided to be safe, and lock the door when I was inside. I'd like to say this feeling left after a while, but no. It only became more frequent. I had to lock and cover my windows at night, because it felt as though someone was peering through them. I told people about it, especially those I lived with. They'd tell me it was a bear or maybe some ghost. A few even mentioned that it could be a stalker. I knew it was neither of these things. It just didn't feel right. Fast forward to about three months after the first occurrence. It's September and the weather has begun to get colder. I was outside with my dogs cleaning some skulls I had recently gotten from a trapper. I was just minding my own business, all of my family members were gone, so I was left alone again. Then I went near the forest and felt the dark presence again. It was so strange. I just couldn't shake it off as nothing. Scared, I went inside and decided to make myself some food in the comfort of my home. The fear left and I felt safe again, until I heard the dreadful sound coming from the woods outside. It sounded like a man screaming, a deer howling in pain, and the low growl of a bear all at once. It was the scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. 
I checked all the doors and ran to the second story of the house to hide. I'm not sure why I felt so much fear, since I heard nothing after that. But I called a relative, and they told me I was just hearing things. That night, I could barely sleep. I was afraid of whatever this thing was, was going to come inside. I kept seeing things in the shadows of the trees after this incident. It was hard to ignore. Eventually, I went to live with my mother in the city. I was there for a better chance at a job. I also had some friends to reunite with there. Once I moved, I met up with my childhood best friend. She and I decided to take a long walk in the chilly temperatures of the night. We talked and talked. Nothing happened until about 11.30. We were crossing the street when I heard the same exact sound, but much louder coming from the woods down the road. I was terrified. My friend, though, paid no attention to it. We continued walking, but I was a little more paranoid than before, just waiting for something to jump out after me. An hour passed and we had to split ways. She went home and I did too. I had some instrumental music playing on my phone to keep me calm. Obviously. That didn't last long. Of course, something had to happen in the dead of night while I was alone. As I walked in the streets, I heard a baby scream. But it didn't sound normal. It was a horrifying, distorted scream. I looked in the direction of the sound and thought I saw someone there. My feet moved faster than before, trying to get me home. Then I heard another scream, much scarier than the first. I ran for it. That might not have been the best decision, but it was instinctive. Suddenly, I heard feet hitting the pavement and felt like something or someone was chasing me. I looked back quickly and thought I saw a large black figure coming, but it only lasted several seconds till I saw nothing. The shouts and screams did not stop though. I finally got home, but I realized the door was locked and couldn't get inside. Unfortunately, those screams continued. After many calls and pressing the doorbell, my stepfather opened the door. I was a hyperventilating mess, but I got through it. I'm very spiritual and I've been told by many mediums or spiritual leaders that I am a beacon for bad spirits. I assumed that it was a bad spirit, but I remember reading about Wendigos, a creature that is apparently connected to me in some ways that are unknown to me. I did research again and deeply believe that whatever followed me is still watching me. I'm not sure if it's a Wendigo, but it could be. Some acquaintances agree that it is quite possible. Now I'm just waiting for my next encounter with it, and I'm left wondering, what does it want, and what will it do next? When I was a child, I lived in a rented two-floor house. My father and mother both had to work, so I was often alone in the house when I got back from school. One day, I was delayed on my way back from school. It was early evening when I got home and the house was dark. I called out, Mom? And heard a faint voice say, Yes? From upstairs. I called my mom again, and again, got the same. Yes? Reply. It sounded like she was calling me, so I started climbing up the stairs. When I reached the first floor, I called her once more and heard the... Yes? coming from the back bedroom. I felt a certain uneasiness and wanted to see my mother as soon as possible, so I hurried closer to the back room. I was about to open the bedroom door when suddenly, I heard the sound of the front door downstairs opening. My mother came in, carrying lots of shopping bags. Sweetie, I'm back. Are you home? She called out to me in a bright voice. Hearing her voice, I completely regained my confidence and ran downstairs. Just then, 
I happened to glance over my shoulder towards the back bedroom. The door to the room slowly opened with a creak. For a moment, I saw something strange in the gap of the door. The pale face of a man was staring directly at me. And being a bit of an antisocial person, I tend to walk my dog in the middle of the night to avoid the neighbors. I find that leaving the house around 2 a.m. ensures that I'm out after most of the late nighters stay out and before others get up for work. I enjoy walking around my neighborhood in the quiet hours of the morning. And with my dog around, I have never felt particularly unsafe. I've also always felt rather secure in my knowledge of the local roads and was pretty certain that I knew how to get home, regardless of which way I turned down. Just recently, all these ideas were proven incorrect. I leashed up my dog at 2 a.m. as usual, and we headed out. At first, everything was normal. It was quiet. A few deer ran across the road at one point, and I even saw a fox run between some houses with darkened windows. And thankfully, my dog is very well behaved. And other than pausing to watch the wild animals run, she didn't pay them much attention. She didn't pull to run after them or anything. All in all, it was a very enjoyable summer night, and I was pleased to be walking in it. We had been out for a half an hour before I ran into any trouble. Some couple in the neighborhood seemed to be arguing, so I turned down a different road than usual. As I'd said before, I didn't think much of this because... All the roads seemed to cross, and I was pretty sure I could get back on track fairly quickly. I got to the next road that I planned to turn down. However, there was some loud music and a lit up house. So I went down a little further, planning to turn on the next road down. I was starting to get a little tired, and planned to start making our way home. I was just waiting for another road to take us back to Oak Street, which would take us straight home. But the longer I walked, the more houses I saw, and it was a very long time before I finally hit another road that turned the way I wanted. It wasn't a road I'd heard of, and it seemed to have a bit of a hill to climb. I considered turning around and walking back the way we had come, but I was pretty sure that this road would connect to Oak Street, and it would be much faster just to go this way. Besides, my dog seemed eager to go, and was happily pulling toward the hill. I gave in and we began to climb it. The houses on this road began to thin out, and halfway up the hill they gave way to trees. This wasn't an uncommon thing in our area, and I didn't see any dead end signs, so I didn't think anything of it. When we crested what I thought was the top of the hill, however, I was greeted with an even steeper incline. Again, I considered going back, but this road had to end soon and it had to connect with another road. I could also see a light over the hill, and I knew there was a school in the area, so I assumed the light was from the school, which would be on a main road. I sucked it up and kept walking. The trees to the left gave way to a chain-link fence at the top of the hill, but we crested the hill to discover there was indeed a crossroad, and across it was not a school, but a church. The area on the left had turned out to be a cemetery, and on the right corner, there was a playground. I immediately thought about the time when I was a kid, and had a bus stop across the street from a cemetery. I couldn't imagine having a playground across from one. I was walking up the road, looking for the street sign, hoping this was Oak Street, when the leashman taught, and I realized my dog had stopped walking. I turned to look at her, and saw her staring into the dark playground. It was covered in shadows from the light of the church, and I peered into them, but I didn't see anything. I jiggled her leash to get her attention, but she ignored me. She wasn't growling or anything, just staring. I thought maybe she was tired from the climb. I knew I was. Uh, we seemed to have found the road we were looking for, though I couldn't find the street sign. Maybe we could have a seat on the swings for a minute before we headed home. So I started walking toward the playground. It wasn't a large playground, 
There was a swing set, a couple slides, and a merry-go-round. We began making our way towards the swings. When I noticed, there was something slumped in the baby swing. And then the smell hit me. It was like a dead animal. I stopped in my tracks, but my dog kept pulling at the leash. She was whining now, and pulling towards the swings. I wasn't close enough to see what was in the swing, and I really didn't want to. The shadows caused by the church were deep, and I couldn't tell if it was a human shape, an animal, or just a toy. But I couldn't ignore the smell. Something nearby was dead, and had been for a little while. I made myself move closer, intent on assuring myself it wasn't human. I needed to know it wasn't a child, that I didn't need to call the cops or anything. Maybe some sick kid had been playing with roadkill or something. I covered my face with my free hand and tightened my grip on my dog's leash and I stepped closer to the swing. I squinted through the shadows, straining to see. I nearly jumped out of my skin when a car went down the road, its headlights shining right into the playground and illuminating what appeared to be a doll. A doll in a frilly dress, smeared with mud and reeking of death but definitely a doll, just sitting in the swing like a child had put it there. I glanced around the playground to make sure there was nothing I was missing, nothing I needed to call the cops for, and I turned around and dragged my dog out of the park. I didn't want to know where that thing had come from, and as I walked past the cemetery to get out of there, I was certain I saw a pile of dirt, and all I could think was, that someone had dug up the grave of some poor child and taken the doll. I ran down the hill, and at the bottom I stopped and leaned against the tree and vomited. As I retraced my steps home, I chided myself for being foolish. It was just a doll. There was nothing to be afraid of. Some kid had left their doll in the park, a very dirty and well-played-with doll. The smell might have been unrelated, but it seemed to be coming from the swing set. Had I imagined that? Was it just some roadkill that had been close by? Should I call the cops? They'd probably find me for wasting their time on a doll and a dead raccoon. And finally I decided that I would go back in the morning and I would see that it had been nothing more than a doll and some roadkill nearby. If I saw anything I thought the cops should be called for, then I'd call them. And this was two weeks ago. I've gone looking many times, but I can't seem to find that damn road. My friend and I were both nine years old, and she lived just down the road from me. We always walked home from school together. One day... A car was driving very slowly along the road and the old man inside was staring at us. My friend and I felt very uneasy. All of a sudden, he pulled right up in front of us, almost hitting us. My friend ran down the path towards her house and I ran up in the direction towards mine. When I got into my driveway, I glanced back and saw his car. He was following me. I was very frightened at this point, and I ran up to the door and banged really hard on it. At the time, my family would always argue about whose turn it was to answer the door, and I knew it would take ages for them to open it. I glanced back again and saw the creepy old man walking towards me. He had gotten out of his car. I was almost crying at this point. Suddenly, my brother opened the door, and when he saw the old man weirdo standing right behind me, he jumped back into his car and tore off. Myself and two friends, we'll call them Sid and Ned, were wandering around one night in the dead of winter. This takes place a bit past the end of my dad's dead end road. The road ends and tapers off into a dirt and grass pathway that leads all the way to a creek bank that used to have a bridge running over it. The bridge was long gone and we loved exploring the creek. The three of us were wading along, chilly water up to our ankles, 
thank God for waterproof boots. It has steep banks on either side, ones you have to be very careful to get up or down. We're wandering along in almost total darkness, because of course we're badass teenagers and we don't need no light. I wish we had one. Sid mentions she hears something moving, and Ned and I quiet down and listen, and sure enough, something was snapping the brittle twigs up the embankment in front of us. If you grew up knowing what deer or other animals sound like moving through the undergrowth, you'll be able to recognize it. This was different. This was wrong. We were able to hear what sounded like something bipedal moving across the bank. The thudding of the footfalls was frightening as hell because it sounded like someone in heavy boots intentionally stomping with every step. Sid and Ned, the brave creek wanderers they were, hid behind me as though I would be able to do anything against whatever it was out there. Looking back on it, I'm kind of a little mad. Anyway, we were standing there, stock still, in ankle deep freezing water, for what felt like hours, just listening to this thing moving around. It couldn't have been more than five or ten minutes, and we listened to the progression from our far right to right in front of us when my friends decided to use me as a meat shield, and then off to our left. Eventually, after the noise tapered off, we scurried back up our side of the embankment to head towards home. As we made our way down the small slope onto the trail, which ran between two large open fields, we heard a piercing shriek that sounded inhuman. Nothing like I had ever heard before in those woods. It was like the scream of a cougar mixed with the chattering of some angry riled up bird. There are no cougars, at least not in northwest Tennessee. We froze for a moment to figure out where the sound was coming from and we heard that sound of heavy stomping again, this time moving very fast. In the dull moonlight, we see in the field to our right this weird thing. I don't know how to describe it. It looked like a person, but it was wrong. The stance it had, and the noises it was making. It was hard to see due to the darkness. It looked like a tall, hunched-over, bald person with abnormally long arms. It really did sound like the aliens from the movie Signs, uh, the weird clicking noises they made, only louder and more distorted like an old VHS tape. It almost made me sick, and I remember feeling utterly helpless and terrified, especially since Signs freaked me the fuck out, and it was just a movie. Needless to say, all three of us booked it back to my house. I'm not sure if either of my friends paused to look back and see if it was following us, but I sure as hell didn't. I kept my eyes locked on home. We never really talked about it after that night. Both of my friends saw and heard it, supposedly anyway, so I don't think it was my imagination. Something was out there with us that night, but I definitely wasn't about to poke my nose around and try to find out what. It took me a while to go back to the creek. I never again did visit at night though. During the day, it felt fine. I loved it. It was teeming with life and energy. I remember hearing odd screams from down that way every so often after that, but I tried to chalk it up to animals fighting, even if deep down, I knew it was probably something a little more sinister. This happened when I was a college student. I was on my way home when I stopped by a little girl. She looked like she was about five or six. She grabbed my hand and started pulling. Please come, she begged. My mom needs help. I don't know why, but for some reason I went with her. The little girl dragged me by the hand for four or five blocks until we arrived at a park. There were trees, benches, swings in a jungle gym. Perhaps because it was nearly dusk, the park seemed to be empty. 
The girl wouldn't let go of my hand and she dragged me towards the jungle gym. Nearby, I noticed a woman sitting on a bench under a tree. From where I was standing, I couldn't see her face because the branches of the tree were covering it. I brought someone, mom. The little girl called cheerfully. The woman on the bench didn't move. From behind the branches of the tree, I heard her say, I'm sorry. It's my daughter. There was something about the woman's voice that sent a chill down my spine. I felt like something was very, very wrong. I just wanted to get away from there as fast as possible. The little girl said, Come play with me. And she ran over to the jungle gym. I'm sorry. It's my daughter. Said the woman again in a dull monotone. I still couldn't see her face. Something about the way she was sitting made me nervous. I broke out into a cold sweat. The little girl was playing on the jungle gym behind me. The sun was beginning to set and it was growing darker. Why did you tell your daughter to bring me here? I asked. Why me? At that moment, the woman suddenly screamed out. Jenny! There was a dull thud and I looked back to the jungle gym behind me. The little girl had fallen and she lay motionless on the ground. Her face was pale and her eyes were wide open. Her breath was coming in small gasps. As I watched in horror, a pool of blood began to spread out on the ground around her head. I wanted to call the police, an ambulance, anything. But I was paralyzed by fear. I couldn't move. I looked back at the park bench. The woman sat there motionless. I couldn't understand why she didn't help her daughter. I reached out and pulled back the branches of the tree that were obscuring her face. What I saw made me scream out in terror. It was the face of a dead woman. Her face was purple, her eyes were bulging out and her tongue was protruding between her swollen lips. There was a scarf wrapped tightly around her neck and the end of it was tied to the branches of the tree above her. She had strangled herself. The woman's mouth opened and she mumbled. I'm sorry. It's my daughter. I don't remember much after that. I think I must have fainted. When I came back to my senses, I was lying on the ground. It was very dark and the park was deserted. I picked myself up and hurried home. Later I found out that a woman had committed suicide in that park years before. Her daughter died in an accident and she blamed herself. The poor woman was so distraught that she took her own life. The jungle gym has been demolished since then. I will never forget what I saw. This is a long one, but it was bizarre and I think it's worth telling. I wanted to post this because the person recently tried to friend my husband on Facebook and it brought back crazy memories and I need to vent it out. I got married right at 18. I was a pretty book smart kid, but lacked street smarts. By the time I turned 20, my now ex-husband and I had moved into a rental property in a pretty nice suburb outside of Chicago. In the basement of the house was a big mother-in-law suite where a good male friend of ours, Nick, lived as well. I was about halfway through nursing school at the time. This particular semester of nursing school, I had very early clinical rotation once a week. I was 21 at the time. I am not a morning person. So in order to maximize the amount of time I spent asleep, 
I started loading all my stuff into the car the night before. Bags, books, even my purse. Again, street smarts lacking. One particular night before clinics, I asked my ex-husband Bobby to get a book from my car. Bobby goes, but forgets to lock the door. The next morning when I get to the car, I note my purse is gone. I end up filing a police report. I was most concerned because I had gotten a new job as a nurse aide at a hospital and had my social security card still sitting in my wallet. Strike three for street smarts. Almost immediately after the theft, strange things started to happen. We started getting ding dong ditches all hours of day and night. Someone vandalized mine, Nick's, and Bob's car with strange graffiti, Nazi swastikas, hangman, etc. They egged our house, slashed Nick's tires. We first chalked it up to neighborhood pranksters. But when we started having damages that cost them decent money, we called the police. Not to mention, one day when Bob was mowing the lawn, he noticed piles of cigarette butts outside the bedroom window. The police came out, pretty much did nothing but take a report, and told us perhaps to invest in car alarms and some brighter floodlights for the driveway. A few weeks after this, at 2.30 in the morning, I get a call on my cell. It's the police in a neighboring town. They had picked up someone that had my ID on him, someone named Craig J. When they asked why he had someone else's ID on him, he claimed I was his girlfriend. The cop called me because my name had popped that I filed a report for theft. I assured the cops I had never heard of him before and was told I could pick up my ID at the police station within the next few days. Things started to really escalate at that point, but I still didn't make the connection that perhaps these incidents were related. I started getting strange messages on MySpace, this was 2009, as well as on Facebook from clearly fake accounts with long-winded messages that made no sense. This person started messaging friends of mine as well. I deleted MySpace and blocked this person on Facebook, but new accounts kept getting created. Somehow this person got my email address and started sending me emails as well. I had no idea who this person could be, but they seemed to know details about me that indicated that this was either someone I knew or knew someone I know. The messages weren't overly threatening, but creepy enough to where I started becoming uncomfortable. One night, my friend Lauren and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. Bob, Lauren's husband, and a few other friends had gone out for the night. As we were sitting around chilling, we hear something that sounds like someone shaking the garage door. I go and check the garage. Nothing seems out the ordinary. We had occasional issues with raccoons, so I chalked it up to that but the noises kept on continuing. Lauren and I were getting freaked out at this point. Now, understand the layout of the house. It's a modern style ranch house with no upstairs. The garage sounds move now to the kitchen window. A distinct sound of someone knocking or scratching hard on the window. We called our husbands who did not answer. At this point, we were debating on calling the police. What if it's just an animal or a tree branch? We don't want to seem stupid. As we debate, I see Lauren's face go sheet white as she looks past me. I spun around, and I could see the handle to the front door wiggling. We were seated near the kitchen, jumped up. Lauren grabbed a knife from the butcher block on the counter. I grabbed a small hammer from the drunk drawer. We book it to the back of the house where the bedrooms are. Cell phones in hand, and we lock ourselves in one of the bedrooms and call the police. The dispatcher tells us to stay on the line, move furniture in front of the door if possible, and the police are on the way. We shove a dresser in front of the door, knife and hammer in hand. We agreed if this guy was going to come in, he might be bigger or stronger than us. But we're not going down without a fight. We plan, if he gets in here before the cops, I go for his head with the hammer. She goes for the gut with a knife. Cops show up, banging on the front door, shouting, Police! We can see the red and blue eyes through the window. We leave the room, let the cops in, and they find no signs of anyone present or evidence of attempted break-in. They take a report. In the meanwhile, our husbands finally call us back. They come home, and the cops leave. Flash forward a few months. 
very close friend of ours, Sean, was renovating his apartment and needed a place to crash along with his girlfriend. Bob and I decided that he could stay in our third bedroom in the house. The first night Sean stays with us, we are awakened at 2 in the morning of Sean screaming at someone. Bob and I jump out of bed and rush into the hall and to Sean's room. Sean and his girl wide awake, lights on, looking totally freaked out. The screen is sliced and flopping in the wind. Sean told us he woke up to someone using what he thought was a knife on the screen and started climbing through the window. We all called the cops. They came out and took our statement. Sean describes the guy as best as he could. A white male, young looking, semi-shaved head with what looked to be dark hair. Cops dust for fingerprints, comes back as a match for Craig J. Turns out I knew who he was, vaguely. He was a year younger than me and had gone to the same high school, but I couldn't remember having any significant interactions with him. He lived with his parents a few blocks from my parents' house. Upon realizing that Sean had just moved in, the cops made a statement that chilled us all. He probably didn't realize anyone was staying in the bedroom and thought the room would be empty. Cops go there, arrest him, and he suddenly has quite a story for them. He told them, him and I were secret lovers. I was ignoring him and we had a relationship. He also had been allowed into my house many times. I am floored. He gets charged with something like trespassing or breaking and entering and does light time for it. Maybe a month and has to pay a fine. In the meanwhile, I get a restraining order on him. He gets out and I hear nothing from him. I also develop a completely irrational fear of first floor windows. Around Christmas time 2010, I am 23. I figure the whole Craig thing is in the past. Bob and I decide to get a divorce and go our separate ways and Nick has long since moved out. We end the lease and I move to a less desirable suburb but with affordable rent. I settle on an apartment in a four unit building that had a lock on the entrance and the only way in was with a key or someone opening the door from the inside. I lived on the second floor. By this time I had graduated and was now a nurse and was working at a nursing home. Spring or summer of 2011, it started up again, with calls coming through to me at work, only to have someone hang up. Letters suddenly appeared in the staff-only mailbox, mailed to me by someone with no return address. The strange email started up again from the random accounts. The messages were never overly threatening, but they were long, way too frequent, way too out there. He spoke to me as if we were long-lost friends and had some sort of connection. I didn't think he ever threatened to hurt me, although the cutting into a house with a knife, I don't know what was going through his mind. What I kind of seemed to piece together over the years from all his ramblings is that he had some sort of crush on me when I was younger, and him happening to rob my car was some sort of sign from the universe or something that we were meant to be together. I call the cops, they basically tell me because there has been no threats. And other than the OOP or a cease to desist, there's not much they can do except for watch and wait. This goes on for a while, and finally one night I wake up at 2 in the morning to the doorbell ringing. I'm instantly in a panic. I look out the window. There, illuminated in the floodlight, is Craig. I burst out crying. In my half-awake state, I run across the hall and start banging on my neighbor's door. He was an older divorced guy who lived alone. He goes downstairs, confronts Craig, and tells him the cops have been called, and then I actually call the cops. Then he takes off. I filed a report. They claim they will talk to him, but this only makes things worse. Friends I have on Facebook now start getting random messages from Craig, asking about me, telling them he has important information for me. Other times, he alternates saying I owe him money, and I have debt I need to pay off. My friends block him as he goes along. Meanwhile, my younger sister is living in the city with a few friends. He somehow finds out where and drives to her apartment and confronts her while she has people over. She freaks out. They kick him out. She calls the cops, who basically state that he didn't commit a crime, but offer her a restraining order. Right after this, another incident. My younger cousin is a high school senior on the cross country team. He shows up at my cousin's practice. My cousin has no clue who he is. He starts demanding information on me. The coach gets involved. Craig then gets into a fight with the coach. 
The cops are called. He is banned from school grounds, but nothing more. He then calls the nursing home administrator at my job, asking to talk to me and that he has important information to tell me. The administrator, who was aware of my situation, tells him not to come onto the property or he will have him arrested for trespassing. At this point, I am paranoid beyond measure. Then, just as quickly as it started, it faded off. It is now summer 2012 and the final chapter of In This Saga. I am almost 25 now. A friend of mine named Stacy, and incidentally Sean's ex, moved in with me temporarily while she looked for a place. She was dating a new guy and spent quite a few hours at his place. One day I picked up a double shift starting at 7 a.m. and ending at 11.30. Daisy texted me at 3.30 p.m. stating she won't be home that night and was going out with her guy. I arrive at home almost at midnight. First thing I notice is that the door is unlocked. Uneasy, but thinking perhaps Stacy just forgot to lock it, I cautiously peered inside. I pan my gaze to the kitchen and living room. I can't shake the feeling that I'm unsettled. Something wasn't sitting right. Due to all these incidents, I always made sure that one or two lights were on, even when we weren't home. I was still not even fully in the door when I noticed I was staring into a pitch black apartment, and immediately my brain went into full panic, and I'm glad it did. Realistically, Stacy could have forgot to leave a light on, but my instincts were in overdrive and sounding off five fire alarm bells. My Puerto Rican neighbor who lived in one of the building units was known for his weekend parties. I could hear a party going on downstairs. I book it downstairs and burst into the party and tell him what happened. He looks at me like I'm crazy, but agrees to come upstairs with me. We get inside. He looks around. We see nobody. I start to wonder if I'm just nuts. Maybe Stacy had her boyfriend over and they left in a hurry, forgetting to turn on the low lights and lock the door. He agrees with me and sort of jokingly pulls open the pantry door. What I saw next will never, ever leave my mind. There, crouched inside, is Craig. My Puerto Rican neighbor puts the guy in the chokehold. I call the police. To this day, I have no idea what he planned on doing. Cops came out and he's arrested. Because my neighbor was having a party, he had opened the door to the alleyway. Chances are, he just walked into the building. If anyone even noticed, people would just assume that he was there for the party or whatever. It's more confusing how he got into the apartment itself. My theory is, my roommate at the time was from the country. She was used to leaving her doors unlocked and wide open, and I honestly think it might have just slipped her mind when she went out the door that night. I confronted her about it, and she of course denied it, but that's really the only logical way he could have gotten in. I always locked both the knob lock and the deadbolt whenever I left the house, unless he was a locksmith. I have no idea how he could have gotten in. I didn't stay alone or go anywhere by myself for a long time after that. I feel I actually developed a paranoia because of all of this and was highly suspicious of giving my number or any information out to anyone. He ended up being charged and convicted of aggravated stalking, breaking and entering, and some other charges. I did meet his parents in court who were both shockingly very normal, apologetic people they tried explaining their son. They explained he was mentally ill and suffered from bipolar disorder. When he's medicated, he's okay, but when he's off his meds, he's nuts. After he served time, I did not hear from him for years until 2016 when he found me on Facebook. I was much older now, around 29. I replied to him very firmly that any contact would end in the police being called and that I had no interest in him at all. I blocked him in any way I could. Recently, he found my new husband on Facebook and friended him. He blocked him as well. To this day, I still have paranoia. Had to park my car near a baseball diamond once, and some kids most likely hit a baseball through my windshield and took off because I had a perfectly baseball-sized spider crack on the glass. Despite it being completely logical that it was most likely a ball, I instantly reverted to, oh god, he's back. I have no idea what happened to him. I am also now a total psycho about keeping things locked. Twice my life got screwed up because the doors weren't locked. I have an acquaintance monitor him on Facebook. And from what I've seen, he appears to be going through periods where he's pretty inactive, and then episodes where he's rambling 
over posting, over sharing, and acting generally deranged. I believe his parents were telling the truth when they stated when he's medicated, he's okay. Parts of me felt bad for him. I'm older now, and I've been a nurse for almost 10 years, some of it which was spent in a, in a psych specialty. The mind is a hell of a thing. Looking back though, those were some of the worst years of my adult life. He put me through a lot of anxiety and caused a lot of issues for me. I slept on my couch pushed against my apartment door for the next two years before I moved out of there. I am now married, but the nights where I'm home alone, I still found myself resisting the urge to stack furniture in front of the doors. One of the other fallouts from this situation is that Craig either sold, lost, or gave away my social security card that had been in my purse. Someone tried to file for Medicaid benefits in Arizona using my name and social, as well as obtain a job using my social and fail to pay any taxes, leaving me with a surprise asset freeze by the IRS and the whole financial mess that needed to be untangled before they unfroze my accounts and paid me back the money they had started pulling out of my paychecks for back taxes that I had nothing to do with. My credit got extremely messed up for years because of it. And to this day, I have a lock on my social security number and monitor my accounts like a hawk. Moral of the story, never leave your purse in the car and always lock your doors. Hey, this is the Grimtail Brothers. Make sure you like and subscribe for more. <laughs>